Okay, now we're black against 2188, Akaki. Okay, E4. Let's play... Yeah, let's play E5, which is what we have been playing the last couple of games, which is sort of the premise of the speedrun that we're playing, classical openings. All right, four knights. Not my favorite opening to play against, but it is what it is. Oh, the board is messed up. Apologies. There we go. Okay, so we have a four knights and knight takes e5, the Halloween gambit. Actually, not such a bad line. And it's it doesn't get enough coverage in books and stuff. You have to know how to play against it. And I haven't reviewed it in a very long time, but we are going to play a variation of it that allows us to avoid much of the theory. So we accept the Halloween gambit. And white plays d4. Now, if we analyze with an engine, and I honestly forgot what the best line is. I think the best line, according to the engine, is to keep the extra piece. How do you keep the extra piece? You drop the knight back to c6, white pushes e5, and then you tuck the other knight away to its initial square on g8. And according to modern theory, white does not have enough compensation for the sacrifice knight. But I will be honest, I'm totally out of my league in this line, and my guess is that our opponent has analyzed it, so... We are going to dodge the theory, and we're going to dodge the most dangerous parts of the line. Uh, yeah, maybe knight g6 is the line. Maybe knight g6. Actually, knight g6 is the move that I want to play, but not because we're going to keep the knight. We're actually going to sacrifice the knight back, and that's the good thing about facing these types of gambits. If you're not sure what to do, remember that you can always give the piece back up, and what you can gain in return is a bunch of development. So we don't have to move the knight on f6 at all, we can simply continue as though nothing is the matter. We play bishop b4, developing our bishop to a good square. Then we play queen takes f6, and I have a hard time believing the black could possibly be worse in this position. Uh, and people are confirming that knight g6 is indeed the line. And remember that psychologically, gambit players hate facing this type of line, where you sack the piece back and you take a lot of the life out of the position. Queen e2 check. Okay, that's a very risky move, uh, because one thing that we could do here is move our king to d8 in order to make space for the rook to move into e8. But we've been playing this in a very kind of positional style. So the, the Soviet schoolboy move would be queen e6, or queen e7. But queen e6 I like a lot, because, and we're going to play queen e6, because if white trades, we can take toward the center with our f-pawn, and as a result of that, we can open up the f-file so that when we castle later on, we'll put pressure on the f2 pawn. So we're going to play this in a very solid style. Also, after queen takes c6, we can take with the d-pawn and try to do the same thing to the d4 pawn. Bishop d2. All right, so classic standoff between the queens. And in such situations, you want to avoid being the one to release the tension and to help your opponent develop. We don't want to take on e2. That would be a pretty senseless move. It would simply help white develop his bishop. Instead, we want to continue developing. We want to castle. And this, okay, queen takes e6. It's hard to say what we should take with. Originally, I wanted to take with the f-pawn. But the problem with taking with the f-pawn is that our bishop on c8 is like, hey, what the heck? Like, how am I getting out when you've got these pawns on d7 and e6? So again, in the interest of playing as solid as possible, let's actually take with the d-pawn, which opens up the d-file, number one. Number two, it is now much easier to develop the light squared bishop to d7. Give the bishop a little bit of air. The position is completely equal here. How are we going to win this? We're going to win this by being patient. And first, we're going to win this by developing our pieces. So bishop d7 comes next, a3. And we could trade on c3. We could trade on c3. I think that's a very sensible decision. In fact, I think it's a very interesting decision to trade here. Most people wouldn't do it. Most people would not take on c3. But I'm going to prove to you guys that this has a lot of venom. Leaving white without a knight in this type of position, let's play bishop c6, getting the bishop to the long diagonal, is a line that has a lot of venom because my point is that the bishop on c3 is a very bad piece. We are going to be basically launching a campaign against the bishop on c3 and our overall plan is going to be to pile up on the d4 pawn which seems like one of the most well defended bastions in blacks in white's position but we're going to double our rooks and then we're going to try to get the knight to f5 and before you know it that pawn on d4 let's start doubling rooks is going to become 
a sitting duck if white does not address it. We're going to start playing a little bit faster here because our opponent is playing very confidently and very quickly. Let's start doubling our rooks. The position, I would say, is still equal. And like I said in the previous speedrun video or two videos ago, knowing how to outplay good players from these types of positions is an incredibly important skill. Bishop h3. Okay, I don't see what this threatens, so I think we can continue with our plan. Rook ad8. I th okay, rook h e1. All right, so now it's time for us to take care of this knight. This knight is going to head back toward e7, and then either to d5 into the center or to f5 if the, if the opportunity presents itself. If the opportunity presents itself. I see a little trap. Okay, wait, but knight d5 maybe runs into f5. Knight d5 maybe runs into f5. So let me think about this for a second. You know what would be a good move in this position? You know what, what I think would be a very good move is h5. In order to prevent white from playing g4, we're, we're trying to make it impossible for white to push f5. So we're playing along the light squares. We're going to set up a light square blockade, which may seem like a very passive approach, but we're trying to keep white's pawns as immobile as possible. So now we go g6. We make it very hard for white to push his pawns on the king side. Notice also that rook takes e6 is nothing to fear because we simply take back and at the end white loses the light squared bishop. So our pawn structure is incredibly watertight. We're, we're doing fine here. I mean, our opponent is playing very well. He's not, he's not bending just yet, but we're going to try to keep applying pressure and applying pressure and eventually I think white's going to give out. So... What am I thinking about in this position? Well, what I'm thinking about is that how nice would it be if our knight had the c6 square? It would be very nice if our knight had the c6 square because it would apply even more pressure on the d4 pawn. A lot of people would go knight d5 here, but that's a bit of a dead end. I would prefer for the knight to, to move into c6. Now, how can we do that? Well, we can play bishop f3, but that has a drawback. It allows rook d3 with tempo. I don't want to allow a tempo. Instead, we're going to build... A square for the bishop we're going to play b6 and we're going to drop the bishop back to b7 in order to be able to play knight c6 and the other benefit of this is that we can now push our c pawn up to c5 if necessary okay ooh, this is almost a blunder but somehow white survives after knight c6 rookie four man very fortunate there if we play c5 white has d5 okay let's go knight c6 anyway of course, knight a5 is a move, but the problem is rook e4, knight a5, white is rook e3. Very, very fortunate for the white has these, these moves. Yeah, rook e4, we might want to repeat moves and then get our knight to f5. Maybe that's a better approach. Yeah, he finds the move. Another, another problem is that d5 could be very unpleasant here. d5 could be very unpleasant here. Okay, let's go rook d6. Split rook d6. Yeah, maybe what I did with h5, g6 was a mistake because it has, of course, weakened the dark squares quite quite extensively. So I underestimated that. We're going to have to spin our way out of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite concerned about d5 here, which I honestly totally forgot about. Just like totally forgot that d5 is an idea. Yeah, we have to be very careful not to get mated there. But we have resources. Okay, wow. Yeah, this guy is this guy is very strong. Knight a5 is my initial idea, but okay, let's do let's do it. Let's play knight a5. Yeah, very very strong player. Let's play knight a5. The problem is that there's this rook e8 idea, so we can never leave the rook. We have to keep one rook guarding the seventh rank at all times or the eighth rank at all times which really limits our options. Bishop f6, okay. So if we play knight takes b3 check, wait a minute, that, that looks like a mistake, but I, we need to calculate here. So if we play e takes d5, bishop takes d8, d takes e4, rook takes d6, c takes d6, we are a pawn up. I think black is better there. So that's one option, we can play ed. If we play knight takes b3 check, the king moves to b2. We play knight c5. Bishop takes d8, knight e4. And white takes on c7 at the end of the line. 
So we have to play e takes d5. I'll show these lines after the game, but we're running very low on time here. So I'm going to start playing quite fast. Okay, d takes e4. Rook takes d6, cd. The good thing about this is that knight on a5, which we positioned there, is a monster piece. It's a monster piece because it's attacking b3. And it's giving, what does it give us? It gives us a tempo. What can we use this tempo to do? Well, we can use this tempo to do a bunch of different things. We can push e3, although we run the risk of losing that pawn. The other thing we can do is bring our king closer to f8. We can also play the move f5, which I really like. What f5 does is it solidifies, it solidifies the entire pawn chain. But the drawback of f5 is that white has bishop c7 attacking d6. And if we play d5 there, white has the crazy move c5 using the undefended nature of the knight. So we actually are going to go... The problem with king f8 is that he's got bishop f6. But I think this is better than nothing. Incredible tactics for white. Oh, yeah, wow. Okay, so let's go... Let me think about this. I'm, I'm, I'm debating between king e8 and, e5, and d5. Let's go king e8. Let's bring the king a little bit closer. And if king, c, if king c3, we'll go d5. Yeah, here we'll go d5. No, he's totally legit. He's just a very strong player. Not, as I've said, not every single game is going to be equally smooth. Sometimes I'm going to make mistakes. And I'm going to have to get out of them. Obviously, black is playing for a win here. We're up a pawn. But white's bishops are incredibly strong, and he's up a lot of time. So this is going to be a big challenge to win. Let's go back to c6. Now I'm concerned about b5. Okay, a4, probably even better. So e3, b5. Maybe a5, but no, then goes b5. Now let's go e3. Let's see what happens. Let's play e3. Because if black plays, if white plays b5, the one positive of inducing that move is that it fixes the pawns on a light square so that if the king moves away, we can play bishop b3. It's not all bad here. I wouldn't say I'm in trouble here. I think the position is probably equal, but it's going to be very hard to win this with black. I don't think black is worse. We have an extra passed pawn on e3, for goodness sake. But, yeah. Let's go knight e7. Move the knight away. And here is the point. If white now plays king d4 or king d3, we have the move bishop to b3. What I'm worried about is a5. I mean, that is a super high-level move. a5. In order to, to shatter black's king, uh, queenside pawn structure using the strength of the bishops, b takes a5, bishop d4, and the a7 pawn is in trouble. Bishop e5, also very strong. Going for b8. Okay, I think it's time for e2 and bishop b3. Let's do it. Bail out. Now we can try bishop c4, which is a very ambitious move. Let me calculate. Bishop c4, bishop b8, knight e5. Also interesting, by the way. If we play bishop b3, white plays bishop b8. We take, white takes. There's no way we're winning the game if that happens. But I don't see an alternative. Let's do it. Yeah, very well played by our opponent, I have to say. Let's try knight c5. There are still some tricks. There are still some tricks. But the problem is there's bishop g2. Wow. One more trick that I have up my sleeve. And now bishop b6 is what I'm hoping for. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, he plays perfectly up until the very last and then blunders the piece. But wait, this is far from over. I have to focus, guys. And what people watching on YouTube, I apologize in advance for the sparse explanations here but i i really need to focus here to try to win this this is far from easy even though we're up a piece it's one of those positions as you understand where the pawn on b5 is tying down or nine and a half 46 seconds so 
Yeah, and he continues to play incredibly well here. Yeah, but h3 is another mistake because we so suddenly drop back to e7, attacking the bishop. Attacking the bishop, and now we're going to take on h3 in the next move, and then we're going to be up a full piece. But I have no time. So this is going to be a tall order. Six. Bishop e8, bishop f5. Okay, we can play bishop f5 anyway. Maybe not the best way I'm playing this, but okay, knight f6, we want to go knight e4. Let's go here. Stop the pawn. Now we go knight e4 anyway. The point is b7, we can stop it with king c7. And now we're going to take g3, and we're going to simply push h4, h3, h2. And we win. Wow, that was probably the closest speedrun game we've had thus far. Outside, of course, of my games against cheaters. Because this guy is very clearly legit. Just like an amazingly played game. And the thing that I'll begin with, the thing that I'll, and I'm definitely not proud of my level of play. That was a couple of misjudgments and a couple of like flat out misses. I'm just going to flat out say that my level of play was not super high this game which also makes it instructive because I'll be able to explain like what exactly I missed. In my defense, it is late. I'm running out of gas, but I'll do my best to, to shed some light on what happened as we analyze. So first of all, I don't think I have ever faced the Halloween Gambit. So I never studied it. You know, I'm an E5 player, but I've never studied this properly. And I was afraid to play Knight G8 because there is a good amount of theory here. I don't know what white's main move is. I mean, the engine gives minus 1.5, but I know that. Uh, looks like bishop c4 is the line. And now apparently you're supposed to sacrifice one of the pawns back. Why are you supposed to do that? In order to open up the center and help yourself develop your pieces more effectively. So it looks like, yeah, d5 is a very common type of idea in such positions to sack one of the pawns. And after bishop takes d5, Two games continued, c6, bishop b3, bishop b4, and I think it's, it's pretty obvious that in this position, white has insufficient compensation for the, two, for the piece. White has two pawns, but notice that we have control over all the light squares. So even if white plays f4, by the way, the engine recommends h5, which is similar to what we did in the game. Then we put the bishop on f5, and you have total dominance over all the light squares, uh, on the king side, so it's impossible for white to push f5. But we decided to give the piece back, which I think is a totally valid approach. The engine doesn't love this. What's interesting, I think, is that if you are giving the piece back, after knight c6, e5, yeah, I don't know if the way that we did it was the best way to give the piece back. Maybe not, but anyways. Queen takes f6, and queen e2 is actually, I think in retrospect, a very strong move. Because if white doesn't play queen e2, then we get to castle, and we get to play d5, and the position is dead equal. For example, if white plays bishop c4, then I was planning a very strong move in this position, a strong positional move, c6. c6, castles, d5, Everything is groovy, rookie one, bishop e6. We're fully developed, we're happy. Black is probably even better in this position. What's the point in controlling light dark squares in games? Well, okay, square control is inherently good. And, and I'll have videos eventually on square control and what that means, but if you look at this concrete position, don't overthink it. The point of controlling f5 is to prevent white from playing f5 and rolling you off the board. And the point of controlling g4 is to prevent white from playing g4, which ultimately prepares f5, which rolls you off the board. So controlling a complex of squares in, in a positional sense greatly limits your opponent's ability to operate on those squares. And when, when I say the word operate, what I mean is to use pawns, to advance pawns to those squares, or to use pieces. It's like buying a hotel in Monopoly. It's like every time you land on it, you get charged. It's, it's your house. When you can operate on these squares as you see fit. 
Okay, so queen e2 check was the first thing that I sort of underestimated. Okay, queen e6. I think queen e6 is normal. And bishop d2. Castles and queen takes e6. I think our opponent chose a very appropriate moment to trade queens. And what a lot of people don't understand is they think every time I play a 2100, I'm going to blow them off the board. Okay, that, that, that's not how things work, even in IRL. If you were watching my US Open games, which was my last OTB tournament, in round two, I faced a 2100. I was worse on move 40. Like, the idea that top players are going to roll serious amateur, you can say serious amateurs or club players off the board, is absurd. There are going to be certain games which take on certain paths where the queens can be traded early, and when the queens are traded early, the, the margin of error widens. If you have a very solid endgame, you're going to have three or four moves on every position that keeps the approximate evaluation. And it's very hard even for a GM to win such games, which is why you will occasionally see a GM drawing a 21 or 2200, right? That's not impossible, and some people think it's impossible. So, Queenies, and this is a great example of that, right? We get a totally equal endgame, or even an endgame where white is a tiny bit better, White is super solid, the structure is symmetrical, and all of those things make this game a lot harder to win. Okay. Now, I was really hoping that white would castle queenside here. Does anybody see why this is a mistake? Why would it have been a mistake for white to castle queenside? Yeah, bishop takes c3, very good. And if queen takes c6, intermezzo, you win a piece. And if bishop takes e3, then queen takes a2, and you win a very important pawn on a2. So I was hoping for that, but instead white plays queen takes e6. So we play d e6 to open up the bishop, castles queen side, bishop d7, a3. This is very normal. Okay, the decision to take on c3 was not totally disapproved of by the engine. It's a questionable one. In a classical game, I would have dropped the bishop back to e7, and I wanted to unbalance the position, right? One of the advice that, piece of advice that you're given as a high-rated player is to introduce imbalances into the position. Right? The more imbalances, the, you know, the more complicated the position. And so that's why I decided to play bishop takes c3. My, my goal essentially was to play against the dark squared bishop. I thought that the dark squared bishop is a very bad piece. And my long-term plan here was to pile up on the d4 pawn which is a very long-term plan. Like, you're nowhere near doing that just yet. Okay, so rook g1. Rook g1 is a, is a pretty weird move. I don't think it's the best move. I think the best move would have been to play f3 and close the bishop down. And if I had to choose a side here, I would probably prefer white. So rook g1 is a little bit, little bit odd, although I don't think it's a terrible move. Rook fd8. Why is the bishop a bad piece? Well, it's bad because it's... I mean, it's surrounded by pawns. It has no prospect. It's just staring at, at its own weakness, right? How do you decide keeping queens or trading them as well? Well, there's no, I mean, there, there, it's obviously there's no, there's no algorithm that yields an answer in every position. But in this particular instance, I wasn't the one who decided to keep the queens on the board. White was the one who traded. And the reason why traded, I think, is because white can't otherwise castle queenside. So here it's a very concrete reasoning. It's It's not like, up in the air. It's like white can't continue developing unless the queens are off the board. So, but but it's a hard question. It's a very hard question. And these general questions, like how do you know when to keep queens on the board, even GMs find them to be very difficult. Okay, so g3. Now we start doubling our rooks. Bishop h3 I thought was a very interesting move. Rook a d8, rook a g1, knight e7. We start guiding our knight toward d5 or potentially towards c6 as in the game f4 and here i think i made maybe not a very serious mistake i think h5 is fine no the engine actually likes what i did this is interesting i wonder where the mistake was after b3 b6 is still good okay i think i know where the mistake was this is still fine Oh, actually, no, I like basically playing all the top moves, which is really, really funny. All of these are top moves. Even rook d6, black is better here. d5, knight a5, also top move. And so is ed, so I was just wrong. 
I think I think I, I just underestimated my play. Both of us are playing pretty high level chess here. And I, I am parroting the engine, but I was like really curious to see if I had made any serious mistakes. I will say that I'm still not in love with the way that I played. And what I probably would do if I had a do-over is a move that a lot of you would probably find very strange. I would play knight f5. Now, it's a logical move, it attacks d4, but it allows a trade of bishops and you're taught that opposite colored bishops equals draw. Opposite colored bishops does not equal draw if there are rooks on the board. In addition, why is black better here? Why does black hold all the winning chances in this position? It has to do with the e4 square. You have a monster square for the, for the light squared bishop, a monster square. You have pressure on d4, you have the ability to bring the king out into the center, and this is like a super pleasant position. Black can torture white for ages here. And one way that you can torture white, let's just, let, let's make a couple of random moves for white, is to open up a second front, right? You can basically say, okay, white is really passive, but as long as the position remains relatively closed, I'm not going to be able to exploit that. So c5 is a very dangerous option. If the king loses contact with the rook, if it doesn't, you can go on the other side. You can play h5. You see GMs playing these types of moves very often. All you're trying to do is open up another file. You're trying to open the h file. The rule is when you're more active, you generally want the position to be open, right? Your opponent is less prepared for that. Then h4, right? Then rook h8, and then you still suddenly start infiltrating down the h file. Nothing happens fast here. If white plays h4, then guess what? you have induced another weakness. How do we exploit that weakness? Well, how about rook h8, rook h6, and rook g6? So patiently applying pressure, this is probably what I would have chosen if I had a do-over. What about b6, e5? Yeah, as I just indicated, that is also a viable plan. So we decided to play along the light squares, h5 and g6, controlling all of these key squares and preventing white from pushing his pawns forward and shattering our king side. And you might say, well, I don't get it. Why is h5 necessary? Well, if we would have played b6 immediately as I had planned to initially, I was very worried about the prospect of white pushing g4 and then shoving f5 through. And after efgf, look at how the position opens up. I mean, f6 is a threat, bishop b4. This has already become a very nasty position. So, you know, all we're trying to do is prevent white from achieving mobility with his pawns and keeping the king side closed until we are ready to reopen it. Does that make sense? Playing on the light squares. Okay, so g6, b3, and now the second stage of our plan, which is to vacate the c6 square for our knight. Why do we do that? In order to attack white's weakness, the d4 pawn, which has been our plan all along. Now, white finds a very powerful counter resource, bishop b2, bishop b7, c4. And at this point, I suddenly realized that white has this threat of transforming his weakness into a strength, which is one of the beautiful things about chess. The pawn on d4 has been a major weakness for white all throughout the endgame, and yet white threatens to push d5, and that pawn becomes white's greatest strength. Knight c6, rook e4. Unfortunately, we don't have any discoveries. All we can do is play rook d6 in order to unpin the rook and take the sting out of the move d5. All right. I briefly considered the move f5. Unfortunately, it doesn't work because if, after rook takes e6, the pawn on g6 is hanging. So that doesn't work. Rook d6, I think, makes perfect sense. d5 and knight a5. We had to be very accurate here. There's a very important line here. After, after b4, we play e takes d5. White plays c takes d5, and we have bishop takes d5. And if white plays rook takes d5 and b takes a5 and says, hey, I have got two bishops for the rook, which is typically overwhelming, the line continues. Check. Check. And in this, sorry, king b3. White threatens checkmate in two moves. Can you find a way to prevent mate while also creating a threat? How do you keep the tempo going here? f5 bingo very nice f5 creating some luft and if white plays rook e6 whoop, rook b1 
and the bishop on b2 is lost. I didn't see this entire line. I just calculated up until f5, and I had a feeling that black is in control of the game. So this is a very important line. Obviously, d e6 does not work because you drop both of the rooks with check. And so bishop f6 is a very sensible move, counterattacking the rook. But now e takes d5 comes to the rescue. This is a very important move. In fact, without e takes d5, I think black would be much worse. The other line that I was calculating is knight takes b3 check, king c2, and knight c5 counterattacking white's rook. But unfortunately, after bishop takes d8, knight e4, white has bishop takes c7. And now the d-pawn advances to d6. Most players would calculate that whole line in a classical game. This is not that hard because it's incredibly forced. S nail S. Oh, why do we need to move the knight? Well, that's a great question. We actually don't need to move the knight, but it's like, can you find something better to do? It's not that we have to move the knight. It's that I wanted to move the knight. I wanted to move the knight because I wanted to attack b3 and I wanted to attack d5. It isn't because we have to move it. It just so happens that the best move is with the knight. It's not because the knight is threatened, because it's not threatened. D1 falls with check. That's a great observation. Okay. Uh, you were proposing bishop c8. Yeah, but here white can play rook d de1. Here white can play rook de1. And already it's too late to capture because you get checkmated. All right, so it's now or never in terms of attacking white's weaknesses. Okay. F5, rook takes e6. Or, oh no, you want to go f5 here? Okay, I'll move my rook back. I, I don't think this is a very good line, though. I'll move my rook back. I guess you can play e takes d5 here, but I can play bishop g2 in this position. And just look at all the pressure that white has built and developed on black's position. This is, this is no good. So I think knight a5 is best. Ed, de, and we get into this endgame, which I think should be a draw with best play. Now it's what's interesting is after king c2, the engine calls king f8 a mistake. According to the engine, the only chance at a big advantage was the immediate e3. I saw this move, but I just didn't have the guts to play it. I was worried that I would end up losing that pawn. Why? What is the point of pushing e3? Well, the point is to promote a pawn. The secondary point is that should the white king stop the pawn, the b3 pawn falls and with the b3 pawn falls the overall integrity of white's queenside pawn structure. Does that make sense? So after king takes c3, we can drop the knight back to a5, and we can start harassing the c4 pawn. Black has pretty good winning chances here. We're just up a full pawn. I mean, we're up a healthy pawn. And king d4 is impossible because of the fork. So white has to play the suboptimal move, king d3, which runs into bishop a6, and we win the second pawn. So... E3 would have been a lot more bold and a lot more rewarding than the timid king f8, which allows white to put the bishop on f6. And, you know, this is just a very annoying move. It's like an elephant sitting on us. The other thing that I was very close to doing is playing f5. How natural is this move? You're creating a pawn chain. The problem with this move is white has this resource. Bishop c7, attacking d6, d5, and c5. And you can't take because you dropped the knight. And I had no idea how to evaluate this position. This is such a wild position. Both sides have sets of connected passers. I didn't want to risk losing the game. So this to me was a little bit too brazen. So in any case, bishop f6, we bring our king to e8, king c3, and d5. And honestly, I think, of course, this game should end in a draw after knight c6. Because white has enough activity to compensate for the extra pawn. And I think our opponent played excellently at first. b5, all of this was perfectly done. Bishop b5, e2, king d4, and bishop p3. Of course, black is the one playing for a win. Black is the one in the driver's seat. But I think our opponent was doing a phenomenal job of making the draw all the way up until, up until this moment, of course. All white had to do to secure the draw was to take the pawn on e2, rather than taking the pawn on b6. King takes e2, knight c4, king d3, and actually black is the one who has to bail out here. Knight a5, bishop b6, knight c6, and we have a simple dead draw. So there were a couple of inaccuracies along the way that I skipped. 
Uh, if we're analyzing with an engine, it appears that in this position, the most accurate move was a slightly strange move, f5. I guess putting more pressure on the king side, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is that here, after b5, 97, bishop b5, a big advantage was yielded by the move bishop to f3. So bishop b3 was actually a mistake. I think this was a theme. Like I, I underestimated the value of this passer. Black, white plays bishop b8, and now here's this idea. Knight c5, and if bishop takes a7, let's see if anybody can spot the brilliant winning move. There is a brilliant winning idea. I saw this hypothetically, but I missed the critical detail. Black to play and win. Not knight c3, because this doesn't create any threats. What does this threaten? It doesn't threaten anything. The king is going to keep in contact with e1. Knight e3 is correct. What does this threaten? This threatens knight c2 and e1 queen. Well, you might say, no problem. Bishop takes b6, knight c2, and bishop f2. White wins. This is the line I saw. The critical detail that I missed was that black has knight c4 check with a fork. With a fork. And here, you can actually, you don't even have to take on b6. You can even play the move knight b2, threatening knight d3 check. Bishop f2, knight d3. And now you take, and you take with tempo. And you win a second piece. Because after bishop c8, knight d3, you promote to a queen. Just an incredible line. Knight b2, you don't even take the bishop. Although taking the bishop is winning. Because these pawns are not going anywhere. Look, notice how the bishop prevents the b-pawn. And the knight... Well, the bishop now stops both pawns, and the knight simply returns to c2, and you promote to a queen. What an amazing line. So let's do that again. Why is it necessary to put the bishop on f3? Why does the same line not work with bishop c4? Well, after bishop c4, bishop b8, knight c5, bishop a7, knight e3, bishop e6, guess what? The c4 square is occupied by the bishop. So you have to do it from f3 for that exact reason. After knight e3, bishop takes b6, the c4 square is free and available for the knight. Just makes you realize how deep endgames are in general. Like this is the level of tactics that is commonplace in what seems to be a pretty placid endgame. So after bishop f3, white can survive with king to e1 and just king f2. So you have to get the king to the other side. You're not threatening to take the bishop. But what you're doing is you're using the dark squared bishop to restrict the, the knight. And if black plays knight e3, then somehow bishop d4 survives. Ah, so this is the key, right? With the king on d2, you don't have a move. With the king on f2, you can play bishop c3, and the path to e1 is unobstructed. Perhaps white can hold a draw here. So the engine is giving like minus one in these types of positions. So bishop f3 was the move. Bishop b3 is a mistake that eases that eases white's task. And here there was another chance to go king d8, bishop a7, king c7. Probably a better winning chance than what I did in the game. White is able to draw by liberating the bishop with a5 and bishop c5. But we still would have at least forced white to find a couple of moves. Would I see that in a classical game? Hard to say. I would like to think that I would. If I had probably 10, 15 minutes to think, I think I would see that. That's not such a long line, right? I, I, I was aware of the idea of pushing e2, but all I calculated was this line. I did see knight e3, but I stopped here, and I didn't realize that we could defend also from f3 to vacate the c4 square. So it is really a shame that our opponent played this well, and, you know, at, at the very last moment, at the very last moment, he stumbles with bishop takes b6, allowing the fork. And this is still not an elementary win, but... Black wins this by preventing White's king from entering f6, and slowly we rearrange our piece. Okay, h3 accelerated the inevitable because it just gives up another pawn. White should not play h3. White should just bide his time with bishop c6, but we will play king c5. You know, we'll play knight d7 check, and we'll kind of use our knight to shoulder the king out of the way. Eventually, one of the pawns will fall. Either the f, the b pawn or the h pawn is going to fall, so... So it's a shame, shame that our opponent plundered the bishop in the end, but it was an incredibly instructive game, well played by our opponent. Thank you again, everybody, for the subs, and thank you for hanging out. I will try to stream tomorrow, but for now, thank you all. I'll see everybody later.